Hello and welcome to the Phoenix 50 Info Show. I'm your host, Lieutenant Vince Lewis from the Phoenix Police Department Public Affairs Bureau. Coming to you once again from Phoenix Police Headquarters in beautiful downtown Phoenix. And I'm joined today by MA1 Management Assistant 1, <laughs> the manager of the Public Records uh, Records and Services Bureau. Yes. Amy Kubasak. Yes. Welcome back to the show. You were Thank here you. not too long ago. Doesn't seem like it was that long ago. We were talking about something different, but you're now with the Records and Services Bureau. Help me understand what you all do, because you're a critical component of uh, how we interact with the community. Yeah, so we um, are one of the only bureaus that actually is public facing. So we deal with citizens in person, on the phone, um, and we handle any requests for incidents that happened in Phoenix. So a uh, police officer responds to a call. Police officer writes a report, and then they put it into the system. And then somebody who was involved in that, it could be any anybody or even the general public, Sometimes even the media wants to figure out what happened, what was contained in that report. Where do they go and how do they get a copy of that report? So it's all electronic, right? No. Yes and no. So, okay. so there is a way to do it all electronic. You can go to our website, www.phoenix.gov, and click the button that says Find Public Records. Um, it will walk you through the steps of requesting your, your record online. Um, they can also come in person and, and request that. But... I think it's um, a misunderstanding that if you come in person, you're just going to request it and get it. And that doesn't really happen. So when you come in and request it, if you're not doing it online, you come in and you request it or you make a phone call and you request it over the phone, the person that's helping you has to still enter that request into our portal, portal and you are going to be worked in the order that you're received. So um, they won't necessarily get it right away, but, but it is a way that they can order. Okay, so there is a process, and the best way, the most ideal way, because a lot of work went into setting up that portal. Yeah. Because I remember it's it's been working uh, uh, for the last couple of years, and um, it, it seems to be working just fine. Uh, but you go in there, you, you create a profile, you fill out your request, you put as much information as you have based on what it is that you're looking for, preferably the incident report number, but if not, you can kind of put in some general information and request a copy of that report. What then happens with that request? So it gets assigned, depending on the type of request it is, it'll get assigned to um, the individual that handles those types of requests. We get requests for incidents and for traffic reports. Um, we also get requests for digital media, so surveillance video, um, other items like that, photos from incidents, and those are all separate requests. So if you're requesting an incident and there's gonna be photos related, you have to make a separate request for those photos. Um, and then those get assigned to the detail that would work that type of request. And again, they're handled in the order they're received. Okay, so do you, so the body-worn camera unit handles body-worn camera requests. And they do the, the redaction, the viewing, and then they deliver it to the Records and Services Bureau for dissemination, or how, do, how does that work? Yes, so the request comes to us. Um, we send it over to the body-worn cam unit. They, they review it, they redact it, and they send it back to us and we release it. Okay, so I wanna talk about redaction. What does that mean? Because it's, pair that with what we know and what we how we intend to be transparent as an organization. There's still a process that we have to go through with redaction. Yeah. Can you go over that briefly with me? What, what is redaction, what do we redact, and why? Sure, um, so redacting is, is really just what you would think it would be. We use um, software that we can go through and just black out or blur words or faces, um, street names, just, just various things. Anything that is considered um, PII, so um, personal identifying information, um, we're gonna redact that. So social security numbers, anything that can, can tie something directly back to you as an individual and if that information were to get to somebody else, it could be used in a negative way. We redact all of that. Okay, well, why is it, if, if the record is public, if the police report is public, why wouldn't I get everything? Everybody that the police officer talked to, everybody that was involved, names, addresses, license plates, why wouldn't I get that if I'm requesting a public document? Well, there is public records law that um, protects people, protects, again, that personal identifying information. Um, but beyond that, I think, you know, if you're a victim, you don't want the suspect to come in and request your name and be able to see your address and have them show up at your home. Um, also, if you're even just a witness and it would be um, detrimental to the investigation for your name to be out there, 
we can't release that. So some of it's based off of what the investigation is, um, but for the most part, it's that identifying information that we redact. Okay. So uh, talk a little bit about uh, some of the efforts that you think uh, that you would like us to know about that uh, the Record Services uh, Bureau is is undertaking or uh, to to improve customer service with the with the community because you, you, like you said, where you guys are the most public forward facing unit of the police department aside from the officers and the employees that go out and speak to the community, they come back and they come back to you. Yes. Um, so some things that we've done, we've, you know, we've done a process review. We've looked at the way that we take those requests. Um, we see where things get hung up sometimes. Um, and we've worked with those various units to kind of work through some of, some of those issues and, and kind of pain points that we um, f- have focused on and, and eliminated or are trying to eliminate. Um, you know, just for as far as customer service goes, we've hired more staff. I mean, that's that's really big. We've hired 17 people in the last year, um, and we've also hired a part-time telework group. So we have 10, well, actually, we have 14 part-time employees, and they're all offered um, the ability to telework. Um, they're still in training, but they'll be focused on our backlog, um, which has caused us some customer service complaints. Um, because it is big, but it you know since last year we've come down about almost twenty thousand requests, um, and that and that's huge. So this telework team will be focused on um, helping us reduce that backlog further, which just means those re- those requests are going to be released faster for the public. Okay, um, we're talking with the uh, manager of the record service records and services bureau, Amy Kuvsak. Uh I want to touch on that backlog. How are we feeling it? How is the community feeling that backlog? And uh, again, just drive home what we're doing to get beyond that. Yeah, so they're feeling it in the sense that they may make a request today and not see that request turn back to them for over a year, maybe two. Um, There was a point that we were about two and a half years behind. Again, we have the same back within days to weeks. Are there requests that can be filled in a shorter timeline or does everything go into the same queue? No, so there are so traffic accidents actually tend to be relatively quick, but it is our highest requested item. So we have about 35,000 requests A little bit longer. Yeah. So with, with Phoenix is the fifth largest currently, with the fifth largest city in the United States. The Phoenix Police Department is the largest metro department. We generate a lot of records, don't we? we do. What What are you seeing the most uh, down there at the um, Public Records and Services Bureau? So we get about a hundred thousand requests annually. Um, again, I think it's the traffic accidents that are probably the the biggest number of those. But we do get a lot of requests for body worn camera. Um, incidents are also pretty high up there. Um, on a lesser scale, we get surveillance video and other items that go with um, incidents like recorded interviews. But those, there, we it's a fewer um, in number of requests, but it takes us longer to work them. Mm-hmm. So uh, there was an effort uh, when I I was a sergeant at a PIO here in the, in the Public Affairs Bureau back in 2019 is when I left. But right around then, we were working with LAPD to figure out how we were going to be more transparent when it came to our critical incidents. What we developed was a, a working model, and then now we've got critical incident debriefing videos where we put out the facts and circumstances surrounding a critical incident uh, so that we can help not only uh, the responding officers, fellow employees, but the community understand the facts and circumstances that led to what we consider a critical incident. And, and for the most part, it's going to be when we use our duty weapons on scene, whether somebody's hurt or otherwise. Uh, we've done some in custody death videos. We've done some incidents where officers were hurt, but not it wasn't a, a necessarily a shooting. But our office works uh, closely with yours when it comes to um, collecting that uh, those those pieces of media and, and and so forth can you talk about the role in uh, for the public records and services bureau and putting out 
a critical incident debriefing video. Yeah, so we actually have a special team that's assigned to work those. Um, when we have a critical incident, we know that kind of starts a 13-day timer for us. And we, we need to reach out and request everything that's going to be related to that incident. Um, and then we start working what's going to be in the video. So, you know, typically it's body-worn cam. Again, they have their own unit that works that, the body-worn camera videos. Um, but we have to get the incident, um, and we also prepare items for the next of kin. So we have a 13-day time frame to get that done, and then it gets turned around to, you know, as it's being finished, it gets turned around to your people, and then you guys release it within 14 days. Okay. I know with the original talks when this came up, it was, uh, we were talking with California. They had two bills going through their House and their Senate that were talking about releasing all body-worn camera, all uh, police reports, an insurmountable amount of data yeah. that they would have had to go through to release in a compressed period of time. The goal was 45 days. We thought 45 days would be generous. I mean, who would have thought that now we can do all this and, and turn it around in, in less than two weeks in some cases? But it's not everything, is it? No. It's just a kind of a sliver, right? Yes. It is just a sliver. Um, typically in a big incident, there's a lot of officer response. So there's a lot of body-worn camera footage. And it's not relevant really to to what the people are, are going to want to see. I mean, you may have somebody that's standing on a perimeter for 10 hours, and that's all you're seeing is their perimeter view. Because every officer has a camera. Yeah. And they're rolling for the shift, and it could be 8 to 10 hours of, of yes. data that doesn't relate to the 30 seconds yeah. that yeah. we're looking for. But there's still, even in that slitter, sliver, you're still getting a fair amount of facts and circumstances to not necessarily compromise the case, but kind of help you, I don't even want to say drawing conclusions because conclusions aren't drawn yeah. until after it goes to court and laws are applied, but yeah. you're still getting a fair amount. Yeah, and it, I think it just helps everybody, the public included, in understanding what the events were that surrounded that, that critical incident. Mm -hmm. Okay. Where do, you, where do you see the futures of records going? Do you think uh, we're going to go completely paperless or a, and we're moving into a new building? Yeah. So moving into a new building sometime next year, um, as far as completely paperless, I don't think that'll ever happen. Um, I do think that there is AI out there that can help with redactions. Um, that's probably the future of public records is something that can help, you know, quickly redact the items so that they can get turned out faster. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, anything else you want us to know about uh, what, how do I prepare myself before I show up at Public Records? Um, it's 1717 East Elwood? East Grant Street. East Grant Street. Yeah. 1717 East Grant Street, Suite 100, yes. Public Records and Services Bureau. How do I prepare myself before I make a request? I think it's a really good idea to have your incident number ready, if, if you have one, um, and just know what you're asking for. Um, you know, if, if you're looking and there is some information on the website that can help. It's got descriptions of what each thing is. Um, because a lot of times I think people don't know what they're asking for. They think they're asking for an incident, but what they really need is a calls for service search or a name search or something similar. So just having a good idea of what it is you're looking for is going to really help us fulfill your request. Excellent. Visit uh, phoenix.gov slash police or just phoenix.gov. Phoenix.gov. Phoenix.gov and click on the uh, public records. Find public records, yes. Find public records, perfect. Well, thank you, Amy Kubasai, for joining me today and uh, talking about this. I uh, just want to remind everybody out there that you can help fight crime in your community by sending tips to Silent Witness. Visit silentwitness.org or call 480-WITNESS. Visit us on all social media platforms. We are hiring. Go to joinphxpd.com. And remember, we're all in this together.